White ball! Whether you love him or whether you hate him, everyone has an opinion on Er Joe Brawley. It's safe to say he's one of the biggest characters within the GAA world. Well this week, White Ball caught up with Joe in Belfast to shoot the breeze. Here's what he had to say. Joe, in general, what's your views on the current state of Gaelic football? Is it in a good place now or in a better place than it has been? Well, we have great numbers, great participation. So we're in a very, you know, we have great participation. Obviously, the game has gone very poor since Jim McGuinness's tactics began to sort of spread through the whole club and county scene. But you can see in the National League final with Kerry and Dublin, and also the under-21 semi-final, if you saw it between Galway and Kerry, I think we saw the two different paths the game can take. We saw... Donegal and Dublin playing that shuffle back, pointing at each other football, where you can't actually win the game if you go four or five points down, you're just stuck in the system. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Bowie and Kerry, they both went for it. Yeah. It was a magnificent spectacle. Because players are so skilled now and they spend so much time training. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that um, the penny's starting to drop that you need to commit oh, yeah. to attack, and uh -huh. Kerry showed that in the National League final. Absolutely. And hopefully, this is going to be the beginning of a recovery for the game because people really are. It's well hard to lose an interest. Aye. We love the game and we love, you know, uh -huh. we love the lads and we, you know, we, look, we're here tonight. Aye. Look at the crowd that's here to see yeah. the 16 league game up in Milton. Awesome. So we love the game, but we can do a lot better and it can be the what best field game on the planet. Yeah. Well, back in your heyday, would the players have had a, a different attitude to the sort of hyper fitness model we're accustomed to in the more modern game. Well, it was a very different type of thing. I mean, the sort of training we were doing. I mean, Derry routinely would have trained four or five times a week whenever mm -hmm. we were in our pump. Yeah. But I mean, the training was nowhere near as scientific as it is now, and I'm sure a lot of the training we were doing was counterproductive. But I mean, it was a lot of fun, and we did play man-to-man -man football. Yeah. And you live, you know, you lived or died by man-to-man -man yeah. football. So if Peter Canavan got a goal and two points off Kieran McKeever, he wasn't looking over the sidelines saying, "Here, boys, where's the sweeper?" Uh -huh. You know, we played. The yes. two teams played and went for it. So, you know, you can see anybody who has watched football throughout that era can see that there was no time for chatting. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were games that people were totally absorbed by. Yes. Nowadays you go to games involving Tyrone, Donegal, Calvin, Monaghan, that sort of thing. And I know that Monaghan and Donegal are both now laterally trying to change their style to make it more attacking. Yes. Because they see, you know, mm -hmm. that, that they can't really succeed playing mm -hmm. with an entirely negative game plan. Yes. But you go to those games and you see people are chatting. They're having a conversation. It's like a cricket match. Yeah. So, you know, I think a big problem has been the coaching orthodoxy, which is look for sweepers, look right. for extra defenders, try and keep the score down. And it has changed the whole impetus of the game, which was always to go out and try and win it. Yes. Play with a bit of joy and a bit of self-expression. Right. Rather than lose it. Rather right. Which is what sport is. Yeah. Go out and have a go. Absolutely. So, tell us a wee bit about your trademark celebration back in your heyday. Where did well, you get the really idea? Well, it only started because Harry Gribben was managing the Derry team against Down. When they were the All-Ireland Champions, they came up to Celtic Park. Yes. In those days, you only came up a few weeks after the All-Ireland Final. Uh -huh. you know, your National League started, so they were playing us up in Celtic Park, and we had to give them a guard in honour, which was sick, guard of honour, which was sick enough. And anyway, I was a bit late for the game, and Harry didn't start me. Mm -hmm. He came home away, so London working or something, so Harry didn't start me. He just always had the personality issue, you know? Yes. And, um, Anyway, he brought me on me about 10 to go. Maybe we were three or four behind, and I just like completely ran right. You see, I was in Britain turning, he wasn't really a cornerback, he was a very good midfielder for Burn. And, uh, and then after I did a few points, you see, a ball was kicked in along by Tobel and over the top, and I was through. Just uh, a lob the downkeeper into the far corner. You see, and the, big, the crowd went mad. You see, it was a huge crowd. Oh, down of course. The yes. There was a big rivalry between us. And I, I was really blowing the kisses at Harry, and then I saw the crowd's reaction. And so, this is good. And people really enjoyed it. So I used it then whenever I knew it was the killer score. Because uh -huh. it tended to demoralise the opposition. I remember uh -huh. Fergal Logan said one time that when he was the captain of Tron, they were coming to play us in a big game in Clonus and he said, like, no matter what happens, make sure that fucker isn't blowing kisses. <laughs> you know, because it became a demoralising thing for the opposition. Yes. Um, well, tell me this. Hold on, hold on. Right, go on ahead. <laughs> Them happier times or glory days for Derry football, they seem yeah. to be a, a sort of a distant memory now. Yeah. What do you think went wrong? Well, I think, you know, when we, we, we got to a National League final four years ago against mm -hmm. Mayo, or we beat Mayo in the semi final, a really electrifying game. Mm -hmm. We were playing the right way, all right. The dubs dusted us then in the final. Mm -hmm. But 
we should have stuck to our principles of playing Gaelic football. Instead, what has happened is we've imported this game where we've got everyone playing behind the 45. And I mean, for yeah. example, against Down this year in the National League in Celtic Park, I mean, uh, that's the lowest. I said RIP Derry football right. after the trauma match last year. Yeah. But I mean, we've never been lower than that Down game in the National League. Down hadn't won a match for two years. Yes. Until the previous Sunday when they were lucky against me, they got an early lucky goal and it gave them the impetus to hang on. Uh -huh. But I mean, after 29 minutes that day, the score yeah. was 110 to a point for Down. So, I mean, we had everybody behind the 45 all point, pointing at each other, no individual responsibility, and uh, I mean, it was the it was it was the low point for us, you know. Yeah. Well, listen, after Dublin's incredible. But it can only get better. Look at Fergus McCusker's under 21s. We're playing a bit of football, playing with a bit of style. Yeah. Tell me a bit about Dublin's unbeaten run there, and now it's came to an end. Do you think is there any sort of merit with comparing them to the great Kerry teams of the 80s? Come on, referee! Apart from the fact you're 100 yards away from it. Come on. Look. He's allowed to open up his chest, that's all he did. He opened up his chest. Come on. Give the kids a chance. You're a hundred meters away. Go on ahead. So he is looking shape of. That's brilliant. You couldn't make it up. You got that alright. Oh, right. I, I was just gonna ask you. You got about, all that uh, <laughs> <laughs> about, about uh, Dublin's unbeaten run and the mer the does it the comparison between the great carry team and the 80s, is that merited based on what Dublin have done? I well I mean they were a brilliant team too, of course, and you'd have to say that. The foundation stone of Dublin's great success now has been is they have brilliant footballers. Mm -hmm. But having said that, they've also got a brilliant, humble attitude. You know, right. for example, whenever the Cavan Stewards went to clean the changing room in Breffney Park recently when Dublin played in the way in the National mm -hmm. League, the Dublin boys were coming out with mop buckets and Aye. brushes. The place was spotless. Yeah. An attitude of humility. Aye. You know, and uh, I mean whenever I went to the morning of the National League final, Johnny Cooper's injured. Yes. Their great sort of all-star corner. Uh -huh. And he he was unloading the kit van. Aye, you know it's a bit like that great New Zealand thing about cleaning the cleaning the change room. Similar you know what to I mean? that. And you see that humility, and you don't see, uh -huh. you know, you don't see any um, rancor when players uh -huh. are taken off. The, cult, the culture of the individual yeah. is gone completely. So that arrogance that people see is false. Based on I don't see any arrogance yeah. with them at all. I see the opposite. Aye, uh -huh. no, themselves. A really humble team, yeah. you know, who uh, who love to play, who play the right way. Uh -huh. And I think that you're in a situation now where. But like what Oshie McConnell said, I said, like, how, how sick all Ireland club teams? How do you keep going? He says, just love playing. Aye. You love to play with the team. You exactly. don't want to miss a game Aye, with camaraderie. them. That's the more important thing. Yes. See, people think it's about winning titles. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's about that chemistry. Aye. Oshie was saying, you know, and if you asked Oshie, he would say, oh, yeah, it was about winning titles. But in fact, what it's really about is playing a huge them. enjoyment of playing yeah. with the group. Like, you don't want to miss a game. Aye. And that's what's, that's what's missing in the modern game. Yes. Players leaving panels, boys going to America and saying, mm -hmm. boys do want to play club championship now during the summer. Because they're saying, what is the point of this? Everybody behind the 45. Aye. So know, negative. It's, oh, it's wearisome. You're just treated as a robot. Uh -huh. You're just fulfilling a role that the manager foresees for you. Yeah. You're not expressing yourself. You know, so... I have to ask you now to have you here. The comments over Gooch recently in his retirement, do you stand by him? or They overrated think, Colin Cooper. Were they romantically overrated? No, no, I stand by them. You know, I think he was a marvellous Gaelic footballer, beautiful Gaelic footballer, but he wasn't one of those footballers who'd turn a game around for you in the crunch. Mm -hmm. And you could see that, so that four All-Irelands where he, where he looked great were absolute routes against me over court. And since 2009, since 2009, against really, really difficult opposition, mm -hmm. Really, really good teams who are getting stuck in. He hasn't been able to lead at all. Okay. You know, he's been a peripheral figure. And the great players who are held to higher standards, the Bummer Listons, the Jack O'Shea, yeah. who were able to drive through, you know, and change games, Porrick Joyce, players yes. like that, Colin Moore, turned two All Ireland finals. They're, the, they're for me, they're the greatest. Well, I was going to ask you. Colm's a beautiful finisher. And yeah. a beautiful, I mean, I'm not going to turn him down if he no, wants to come oh, and play for his Bridges. Of course. Please do. <laughs> Please <laughs> do. Gonna, but I think it's a different thing. And I think also, for me, it highlights you know, the, the, the mock outrage that's out there all the time. Now, oh, how dare you? you yeah, know, yeah, of course. I mean, it was like criticising Mother Teresa. Ah. You know, silly stuff. <laughs> now that well, I was just making a logical point. Of course. Well, listen, you mentioned the great footballers there. Who's the best you've ever seen or played against? Up close playing with James McCartan and Peter Cannon. Yeah. Extraordinary Gaelic footballers. Canavan's career longer, Canavan more skilled. McCartan changed everything for Ulster. He changed everything for Ulster. Mm -hmm. No Ulster team was going to win in All-Ireland. He came along with that down team and just electrified the scene. Yeah. Um, and he was unstoppable. Yes. You know, but he burnt out very quickly. Canavan extraordinary everything. A yeah. warrior, a leader. When Peter Cannavan was liberty. captain in Ireland against the Aussie Rules teams, Colin Cooper wasn't going. Yeah, you know, I think that, that's a good way to, to compare, compare the two. The two. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, 
um, give me Canavan every day because Canavan had everything and you couldn't sicken him and whenever he was marking players like Kieran McKeever who most assuredly would have done for somebody like Colin Cooper mm -hmm. or Sean Marty Logger Canavan refused to accept it uh -huh. he fought and he fought and he fought never lay down McKeever said he, now Canavan always said his misfortune was to play when Kieran McKeever and Sean Marty Logger were playing they said exactly the same thing about uh -huh. him because he gave it to them in buckets yes a total winner Pugnacious, you know. Yes. Um, Tomas O'Shea said in the TV, oh, I cut the legs off him two years ago. But that was about a different thing. That's about the feigning uh -huh. and the diving, which was also part of Canavan's game. Yes. But you want a warrior to lead you in the last quarter of the game. Uh -huh. He's your man. Ah, oh, Jesus. And the kid never laid down. I mean, uh -huh. it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And he was sm Cooper six foot one, Canavan was five foot seven. Yeah. Forget about it. There's no comparison. Does it hurt you a wee bit that he's a throne man? No. Not no. at all. No, not at all. You'd have took him all day. Canavan? Uh -huh. oh, get out. Would you give him your jersey? What do you mean? Would you give him 13 if you had to sit on the bench? Well, let's be fair about it, he would have got it like if he'd been playing. If it was a toss up between the two of us, I think Canavan would have got it. <laughs> there wouldn't have been much debate with the selectors. Alright, uh, yeah. seeing as we're comparing people there, in their heyday, who's a better midfielder? Andy Toho or Sean Kavanagh? Well, you see, Anthony was a classical midfielder. Now, he was a very good attacking player. Kavanagh really was a brilliant attacker. Mm -hmm. Not playing with his back to the goal because he hated that. Any time they played yeah. him in full forward, he hates it. Uh -huh. you know, he's a big man like Anthony. Yes. But as an attacker from the middle of the field, so whereas he played basically as a third, he was the attacker. Yeah. And McGinley would come out and defend. I mean, he was peerless because he's like a horse. That's right. He's a brilliant finisher. You know, um, you know when he's running, when, once he gets a gallop up, you're not going to stop him uh -huh. unless you do a Sean Gavin on him. Aye. You know, so <laughs> he could have been stopped. But by should Sean be Gavin done now by everybody who comes anywhere near him. <laughs> come here, I want to yeah. ask you. Aye, but I mean, you've got to say, what a Football or right. I remember Kavna. The first time I saw what a great player he was going to be was when he was only he must have been 19 or 20, and it was in Casement Park. We had drawn somehow with Tyrone in the first round in 2003. Mm -hmm. We drew with them. In fact, they got a draw with the last kick of the game. We nearly had them beat. Aye. And Kavna played midfield in the replay on Toho. And like Toho was a god of football then. Kavna must have scored five or six points. I mean, he was just awesome. And Aye. I thought, oh my god, just get his. How's he doing that, Anthony Toho? Yeah, because he attacks. Attacks yeah. all the time and attacks down the middle. The young engine, I suppose, too. Well, not even then, sure. I mean, up until two or three years ago, it was He's the same. Still doing that it, gallop, you know, that yeah. pace and that desire. Yeah. I mean, he was a fabulous player. I still take Canavan, though. You still take? Because Canavan, Canavan was. Uh -huh. Canavan came onto the field and a surge of excitement went through everybody. Does Canavan know you're such a big fan of him? Sure. Well, I think people like Canavan who are really special, who are not in the same league as ordinary footballers. Yeah. I mean, like I was a very good player by any standards. Yes. This, this is just a different level. And it was a different level. It was very, very special. You see it once in a lifetime. Aye. And um, I mean, for all the fact that he was, you know, a curmudgeon and all of that, and a warrior, and the sort of way he hated to be on the opposition team, you know. He was the sort of player who electrified his own team. And yes. many the time, how many times in terrible, tight Ulster Championship battles? I mean, that old joke was invented about Canavan in '95 when he took Tyrone to the All Ireland final. And they were so unlucky to lose it. And I think he scored 10 points out of their 11 that day or something. Yeah. And yeah, the old joke about what's the difference between Peter Canavan and a black taxi? A black taxi only carries seven. Ah, yes. And he I carried mean, it was 14. Just extraordinary. Oh, footballer, you know, by any standards. Yeah, absolutely. They'll ask you about this. What do you think of this? Right, this we're nearly over here, boys. I want to see the under 16s. Absolutely. Oh, yes, now pick your spot. That's it. That's how you do it. Okay. Pass it into the net, boys. <laughs> Always pass it into the net. I'm going to ask you. I here. hope you're keeping this stuff. Oh, aye, this is gone. Oh, good, good. What do you think about the craze of sort of sports psychology? And do you think is it any genuine impact absolute on player crap. performance? I'll tell you what it is. It's absolute crap. All of it. Uh, yeah, well, unless you've got someone who's got an actual insight into these things. So, for example, Alex Ferguson was a natural sports psychologist. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali was his own sports psychologist. You know, he rallied the trips around him. Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, imagine taking a sports psychologist to Roy Keane. understand I mean a lot of crap yes. it's, it's all and a lot of it's just by the numbers and of course there's a big industry now of sports psychologists so they go to they do sports psychology uh -huh. in DCU or Jordanstown yeah it's easy to get in there if you're going to be a Sigerson footballer yes so they bring you in there you do your sports psychology now I'm a sports psychologist uh -huh. now you know you know it's that sort of smile or die culture then you know positivity yeah. you know and all of that stuff you know and, and they talk to people as if they were children you know do you ever wonder as about if they were mental patients in a nursing home do so 
you know, you see, I, I work in an area with mm. law where it's forensic and things have to be proven and logical. Aye. The beauty of sports psychology is that it doesn't have to be There's proven. There's no science on it. So what they do is they say, for example, somebody will say, oh, well, I spent three weeks. I worked with Brian O'Driscoll. I worked with Brian O'Driscoll. Everybody says, well, he worked with Brian O'Driscoll. Brian O'Driscoll was scoring a hat-trick of tries against France when he was uh, 20. Yes. I mean, he was one of the world's greatest rugby players almost as soon as he was out of the cradle. Mm -hmm. You know, and what you see is a lot of them attach themselves to players like this. Yes. You know, there's a sports psychologist, I think her name's Bree Currid, and she um, met with Paul O'Connell. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. Paul O'Connell was, was, had come second in the World Player of the Year poll the year before. Uh -huh. You know. Yeah. Well, He's already say, the finished article. Well, I've, worked, basically. I've worked with Paul. I've worked with some of the biggest names in sport. Yes. So then they've established their credentials, and a lot of it's spoofology, You know. Uh -huh. could, do you know what? I would be a brilliant sports call. I could make fortunes. Could be all excited. And I could do you. that. I could do that web summit stuff, and I could uh -huh. do all that sort of you know that Deepak Chopra stuff. You know, <laughs> and uh, and people would believe me. I could go on the Oprah Winfrey show. Uh -huh. They would say that I've got healing powers. Yes. So I can help your cancer. A load of balls, you think? Oh shit! Oh, shit. Finally, who's going to win Sam McGuire this year? Can Dublin be stopped? In championship? I'm not sure that they can. You know, don't forget they haven't started their championship training yet. And if mm. Dean Rocket scored that point in the National League final, they would have won it. I think I shouldn't be telling you this, but RT paid me a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Good Perfect. Man,